Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, my colleague, Charlene Gonda, who was originally supposed to do this talk, uh, ran into some visa trouble, so I thought I would try to sub in her place. My name's Dustin Whittle. I'm uh, visiting from San Francisco, where I work at Uber as a developer advocate, helping builders uh, build moving experiences. And so we're gonna be talking about building platforms for developers and how we built the Uber developer platform and some lessons we learned along the way. And so you probably know Uber by now. Push a button, get a ride. Uber's motto is really to make transportation as reliable as running water everywhere for everyone. And when you think about going to take a shower, you don't think, okay, is the water gonna work when I get home? This is the same way we wanna make transportation in every city across the world. And in under eight years, we've done that on more than six continents in more than 73 countries and more than 470 cities. And we did it by partnering with more than a million and a half active drivers monthly who deliver more than five million trips on average per day. And we hit our two billionth trip last July. And actually in Buenos Aires, we launched last April and, and the, just in a little over a year, we've had more than 100,000 drivers sign up. And so we think this represents a massive opportunity for developers. And so the team I work on is Uber's developer platform, and we really are our external API. And I'll talk about some of the ways we started to expose functionality for third parties to build on top of our API and how we built it. But first, we like to think of it uh, around our motto, building moving experiences. The first part of that is obviously build. And so this is forging partnerships with developers and providing them tools to make magical experiences. And then moving experiences, getting people and things from A to B. And so we want to make it features for people to have a more delightful ride and to create a much more compelling experience, not only for our riders, but for our drivers as well. And so let's talk a little bit about how we got here in the journey so far. So in 2013, long before we actually had an API, developers started to reverse engineer the interactions between our mobile application and our server side. And so what we learned is when there's a will, there's a way. There's no stopping developers who actually want to build on top of something. And so we started to see this need to release an API very early on. And so even before we had a public API, people started to understand how our applications interact and started to leverage our private API to build on top of that. And the first thing we wanted to do is make it easy for people to build, uh, to be able to start a trip. And so it started with a deep link. We wanted you to push a button and get a ride and make that button available in every application. And so we had originally launched deep links. And so a deep link is simply a link into a mobile application that sets some state. So in the case of the Uber application, it was just setting the destination. And so this enabled a whole set of integrations right off the top. So you could start to use transit app to figure out transportation options in a city. And we started to capture intent to ride. If you have a hotel reservation or an airline reservation, we wanted to make it easy for Uber to be your first choice. And so you started to see Uber buttons appear in all the different applications. And we did this not by releasing a REST API, but just by supporting native deep links and publicly documenting them. And so we did this with United and with Hilton and a bunch of other transportation uh, and hotel and airline applications. But in 2014, we released the first Uber API. And by 2015, our first partner started building experiences on top of this API. And today, leading global brands elevate their experience with Uber. If you set a reservation uh, for a restaurant and they can figure out that you're arriving in two minutes, all of a sudden they can create a really great experience around that. The same for hotels. And so we wanted to cr create deeper integrations and expose this. We wanted to make it extremely simple to do. And so we took this motto, push a button, get a ride, and we tried to make it, make an API call and get a ride. Make it very easy to integrate, not only into the application, but also into the states of the ride. And so what is an API? At a high level, it's an interface between systems. Um, I like to think of it as an integration between products, but ultimately it's an experience created by people. And so we have a bunch of cultural values at Uber, and one of them is to let builders build. And so we think if you let builder, give builders the tools, uh, they will already come with the imagination to create really compel compelling experiences. And so we started to release some public REST APIs that made it easy to integrate with Uber. And so today we have four public APIs available. We have a ride request API. This makes it easy to make an API call and get, make a ride request to get from A to B. We launched trip experiences last year that allows you to hook directly into the state of the ride and start to understand where people are coming from, where they're going, how much free time they have, and allow you to pull the Uber context to create custom experiences in your app based on whether somebody's on a trip. And 
then we released our driver's API to make it not only uh, easy to build integrations that benefit riders, but to benefit drivers. Drivers want to get paid instantaneously. They want to be able to make it easy to do their taxes. And so we wanted to create a rich ecosystem of valuable integrations for both sides of the marketplace. And then while we don't have Uber Rush available in Buenos Aires, we, we do have it in various markets around the world where you can not only move people, but things from A to B. Whether you want to drop off a suit at a tailor, rush some documents across the city, it was moving beyond the idea of just moving people. And so we wanted to expose all this functionality as a set of REST APIs that people could easily build on top of. And so you may have seen this, but now if you open up Google Maps, you can actually get the entire Uber experience directly inside of the Google Maps application. You don't even have to have Uber installed. And so we started to release these REST API endpoints and we started to partner with really large companies like Facebook and Google. But we learned a few things along the way. First, the platform is not just a product. It really, it's a vibrant ecosystem. There was a lot of doubts early on about whether we should release an API. Um, what happens if they ruin the experience, if they start to disintermediate Uber? What happens if when you start to lose control of the end user's experience? And so Travis, our CEO, said that we should open it up for developers and the, the benefits of an open platform greatly outweigh the risk. And so we started to invest in them. But platforms are ecosystems. It's not just about having an API, it's about having a successful ecosystem around this API. If you look at some of the earliest platforms, th some of the things that differentiated Facebook from MySpace was opening up their platform very early on to allow third parties to build all the features that they couldn't build fast enough internally. And so we realized that this was really a great way to build features that we couldn't uh, do, uh, build necessarily uh, for our users. And so this is a bit more complicated for Facebook, Google, Netflix, Spotify. When you're just dealing with the digital world, it's pretty easy to expose functionality. But the reality is building a platform that interacts with the real world adds a whole nother level of complexity and opportunity. The reality is that the physical world's complexity is infinite, but we only have 64 bits and 500 milliseconds to make sure you have a successful interaction with Uber. And so Uber's internal architecture looks a little bit like this. Actually, it doesn't look a little bit like this. This is actually a screen grab from an internal tool called Jaeger, and this represents more than 3,400 microservices that power the underlying Uber infrastructure. And more than 100 of those services comprise of the core trip flow, just getting starting a trip and getting you from A to B. And so you can't ask developers to integrate with this. You need to make the complex simple. And so with the Uber's developer platform, this is really what we try to do. We wanted to make it as simple as possible to just make a single API call and get a ride from A to B. And so that's exactly what we did with our ride request API. Push a button, get a ride. Make an API call and get a ride. And so you can start to see that we capture intent to ride and so anywhere where you, ha you want to go to a location, whether it's a dinner reservation or you have a hotel reservation, we wanted to make it easy to expose this functionality. And so the first part of this is Uber is a global company, and so the products are different in every market. And so we started to release our the first REST API was our products endpoint and our time and price estimates endpoint. And they facilitated a bunch of different integrations that I'll show you in just a second. The next is uh, not everybody wants to have a deep RESTful integration. Sometimes people just want a deep link in. Some people want to be able to drop in a, uh, our mobile SDKs and add a widget or a simple button. And so we need to expose more functionality. And then they also need to be able to get details about the ongoing ride requests. And we launched the request details endpoint, as well as uh, pulling your trip history and your profile. But the easiest way to think about this is from an integration perspective. Uh, so some of you may know City Mapper. City Mapper is, uh, allows you to find transportation options in a location, including Uber. And so they use the products endpoint to pull the list of available products in a certain latitude and longitude. They use the time and price estimates to tell you how long it's going to take for a ride to get there and approximately how much it's going to cost. And so with just these three endpoints, we started to enable a whole host of integrations that weren't previously possible. And CityMapper also uses deep links to actually launch the ride request itself. And so not only can they show you the list of products available, the location, and how much it's going to cost, but they made it easy to jump directly into the Uber application. Thank you. Uh, and, to f and to create a ride request. And so they do this using deep links. And so the reality is that uh, it's more than just integrating with apps, right? It's integrating with conversational interfaces, bots, and much more. And so now you can see that Uber is available in Amazon's Alexa, Google Home, Google Assistant, uh, and it's, it's useful in many different uh, interfaces, whether it's through voice, 
uh, through texting, through Facebook Messenger, or through using applications directly. And so we wanted to expose as many endpoints to make it as easy as possible to integrate with Uber. And what we realized is that it wasn't just enough to be able to read the state, you also need to be able to have dynamic applications. And so we started to add webhooks that allow applications to be reactive to the different states of a trip. And so if you look at the life cycle of a trip, you can start to see how webhooks make sense. When you start a ride, you go into the processing state, and this is where we match a driver with a rider. And once the driver is accepted, you switch to the accepted state. As your driver is pulling up, you switch to the arriving state. And then once your trip is in progress, you go to the in progress state. And once you're near your destination, the driver completes the trip, you've completed. But each one of these represents a different opportunity to engage a user. And so we added webhooks to allow callbacks to your application so that you can get triggered on these state changes. And so you can imagine this as being able to offer one experience as somebody's arriving and give them some curated news. Um, and then once the trip is in progress, you can look at how long is the trip going to take and start to create a custom experience around the length of the ride. And so this is one of the things that we really wanted to be able uh, to expose to the real world. And so we called this trip experiences. But really trip experiences is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's webhooks that allow you to listen for the state you can pull the current request, so if I'm a user, give me the current ride details, and then I can get notified uh, for my application when I take a trip regardless of where it originated. So we have this concept of all trips, and you can get notified via webhooks whenever I begin a trip in an Uber application. And so we think this represented a great opportunity for developers because if you look at last July, we hit our two billionth ride. And the average ride in the US is approximately 20 minutes. And so if you start to capture this intent, what you start to understand is there's over 40 billion minutes of free time that you can capture. And then once you start to capture the Uber context, you can create custom experiences around that specific trip for that specific user. Uber's users are transactional. We have riders, we have drivers, we have eaters, and now we have couriers. So everyone who's on the Uber platform is paying money for a service. And so you can capture that opportunity. And so we started to launch the Trip Experiences API where you could understand where somebody's coming from, where they're going, how much free time they have, uh, and start to understand the state of the trip. But you can also start to understand that when somebody schedules a ride, when they're gonna have free time in the future. If you integrate with their calendar, you can look at their calendar and say, okay, you have an appointment in an hour, it's gonna take you 30 minutes to get there, I can send you a push notification and trigger some custom experience around that. And so we started to integrate with third parties to, able to, to capture these moments. And so one of the first integrations that we launched was Auto Radio. Auto Radio provides curated podcasts and news um, for your interests. And we said it would be great if we could integrate that directly with your Uber ride so you could get curated news for the length of your Uber ride. And it would depend on the context. Am I heading home? Am I heading to work? Am I heading out to a restaurant? And it would be curated around your taste. And so in the off-trip experience, it looks like this. This is Auto's third-party iOS application. And then once you're on trip, what they add is a trip tray that allows you to not have to switch between the applications. And this is an embeddable widget that you can build. Uh, and then they start to understand how much time am I going to have. And so you can start to cu curate the, the content around the ride. So in this case, we have you're going to arrive in two minutes and the length of your ride 16 minutes. So now I can create a custom playlist for you for your 16-minute ride based around not only your time and context of where you're coming from, uh, but also around your interest. And so we started to build these types of integrations by using webhooks, by using a REST API, and by using deep links. But Uber's goal and the Uber developer platform's goal is to really help internal and external teams build products. We help internal teams release developer products. And uh, to understand why this is valuable, you have to understand how Uber's engineering organization is structured. And so we like to think of it as programs and platform teams. And so the simplest way to think about it is that programs are built on top of technology platforms. Platform teams build the foundation and the technology building blocks on which program teams build customer-facing products. And so not every API can be released by the Uber developer platform. What we really wanted to empower was our internal program teams to build and release their own APIs. But just releasing an API is not enough. You really need to build curate great documentation, you need interactive API console, example applications, extend your SDK, and you want to do these in a consistent way. And so our challenge with the Uber developer platform is twofold internally helping our internal program teams like Uber Rush and Uber Eats and all of these other great teams, Uber for uh, Business, uh, build their own API products 
but also to ensure that the external developer community is successful building on top of those products. And so again, it's more than just releasing the API, it's about making sure that you build all the tools that enable developers to be successful. And so Uber is a polyglot engineering organization. Uh, we run Go, Java, Node.js, and Python in production, and this is actually in order of preference. We're running more Go and Java today than we once did. And again, if you look at the underlying microservice architecture, it looks a lot like this. It's very complicated. We didn't want it to be this complicated for program teams to release new APIs. If you took, take a look at these 3,400 microservices and the four external APIs that we offer, um, we, we really try to make this complexity much simpler for external developers. And so uh, inside of Uber, all of these 3,400 microservices uh, are fronted by what we call the marketplace gateway. The marketplace gateway is a real our real-time API for exposing services internally and externally. And so it acts as a router for all these internal services, and it's a single place where we handle monitoring and documentation. So if you're a new Uber engineer trying to get up to speed and build a new product, you don't have to figure out all the underlying subsystems. You can understand our real-time API and understand the services that you need to build on top of. And so again, like I said earlier, we work with these program teams to make them successful. And so one of the APIs we enabled them to build was our deliveries API. This is actually the first API that we did not build as a developer platform team that we empowered third parties to build, our program teams to build. And so this is, works very straightforward. This is on-demand <coughs> delivery for not people, but for things. And so you can get a quote for how much it's going to cost to move this thing across the city. You can make a request to the deliveries endpoint, and then you can monitor the status of that um, throughout the, the trip, throughout the journey. And uh, the next one was really our uh, driver's API. This is, again, this is a separate team inside of Uber where we provide them an API platform to build on top of, and then we make it very easy to expose this service externally. And then we also add the polish that a lot of uh, APIs do not have, like adding support in our SDKs, adding documentation, et cetera. And so we wanted to help external teams build on top of these developer products. And so we, we realized that there's a few ways that we could do this, and there's a couple lessons we learned the hard way. The first is iterate with developers. If you think of traditional developer platforms, traditional API platforms, they're run by business development teams. They're generally not completely open, you have to do some sort of a business deal, and there has to be a large amount of value. We didn't want to be that restrictive with our offering. We wanted to make it open. We wanted anybody to be able to go to developer.uber.com, create an application, and go live. And so we started to see some interesting integrations once we opened this up. So this is Bar Roulette. This is, uh, you can select a few friends, select an area of the city, click a button, choose a random bar, and get all your friends there and a ride. And these are the sort of applications that don't get built when you have this closed ecosystem where there needs to be a business development deal in place. And so one of the first things we learned early on is to iterate with developers. Not only does it enable um, interesting use cases, but it also provides a direct feedback loop for what's the functionality that's missing from the APIs and how can you make them better. And so this is a high level of what Uber Developer Platform offers today, but it's getting richer and richer by the day. And so let's talk a little bit about how we actually built this. And so if you look at the traditional engineering developer relations model, this actually comes from a Google slide on developer relations. This is the traditional model. And so the platform and developer relations, platform, the engineering and the relations team are separate teams. And so the goal is to create a very tight feedback loop from what's working for developers and where they struggle and to be able to build, help them build better apps and create successful integrations. And so this is really the model that we have at Uber. And so this doesn't work everywhere. I think a large reason this works for us is because our teams are highly autonomous. Um, we, we are enabled to um, help these program teams build because every team is independent. And so they're not required to follow some engineering stack or one particular design, and we need to make it flexible for this model. And so the way we think of it today as we think of our core platform, this is our infrastructure. This is uh, compute, network, storage, deployments, all the core features that power an API. Then there's the teams that actually build our developer products, our uh, APIs, like the ride request API and the trip experiences API. This is our features team. And then we have a mobile and uh, server side team that's focused on our SDKs, making it easy to expose functionality. And then we have two different orgs uh, or teams for building partner engineering and developer advocacy. So we think of the community as the head, the tail, and the, uh, the long tail. The head, the torso, and the long tail. 
And so how you work with Google and Facebook differs from how you work with developers on Stack Overflow. And at Uber, we need to be able to accommodate both, working with some of the largest internet brands, but also working with anybody who shows up on the internet and wants to build on top of us. And so we started to restructure our team. And so we started to figure out that um, developer and advocacy and partner engineering should be an overlay across all of these functions because ultimately they need to have an impact across the entire org. And so we started to think, how does this actually work with our platform team? They figure out what are the bug reports from the community, what are the um, new launches that are gonna be coming and how do we do capacity planning for that? And what are the stability needs? And then developer advocacy and partner engineering starts to work with our features team by figuring out what does the community need? Like what are the integration points that make sense? What's the right API design? And so we've iterated a lot on between the different versions of our endpoint directly based on feedback from the community. And a large part because we listen directly to our developer relations teams, but also to our partner engineering teams. The use case for Google where we have this asynchronous API is different from long tail developers who are happy to build on top of a RESTful synchronous API. And so they take those design requirements and we start to implement them. And then we have our SD SDKs team that really focus on how do we make this as easy as possible to expose uh, in an external package, whether that's a Python pip package um, or an iOS or Android SDK. And then also relay developer feedback. But it's about being a uh, two-way communication cycle. We want the platform team to be able to uh, bring up developer issues, let us know proactively if there's gonna be some level of maintenance or some sort of planned outage or failover testing. Uh, and to address stability concerns. We want to be a great shepherd to the platform, which means we, don't, we want to be as transparent as possible. And this requires great communication, both internally between our teams, but also externally. Uh, and then the features team. Uh, you know, what do long tail developers need? What's the right API design? And then what's the source of truth for how this should work? Uh, sometimes it's not clear whether it's a feature or a bug. Did we intend it to work like this or does this just happen to work in this situation? And so having the source of truth be this team uh, makes it extremely easy to support uh, the entire community. And then again, with the same with the SDKs team, being able to solicit feedback on where the SDKs work and they don't work, um, and then being able to build custom solutions for developers. It's not just enough to offer a REST API, you really want partners to be able to understand a use case and the scope of work that they're committing to very quickly. And so we started to package up different types of integrations, one being deep links, uh, the next being the REST API. But it's more than that, especially in a mobile ecosystem. And so we started to really single sign-on. You can think of this as like Uber Connect, where you can drop in and uh, sign in with Uber button, and we can get the Uber profile as a result. We wanted to make it easy for third-party mobile applications to directly deep link into our application, whether it's to apply a promotion code or to set a destination and start a ride. And then we wanted to make it very easy to drop in buttons into any application. And so all of these were different products that were built directly from developer feedback, where it was the REST API was too complex for them to build their use case, or they didn't want to have to engineer a new Uber button, they wanted to just drop in our SDK and be able to use it. Um, the other use case that we found is that a lot of people didn't have the Uber app installed, and so they wanted to be able to offer this entire Uber experience, but without having the SDK, without having the Uber app installed. And so we built a self-contained ride request widget that enables you to drop the entire Uber experience directly into any mobile application. And so this works whether or not the app's installed, you can create an account and create a ride, and this all happens within the context of your application. And so all of this is great and all of these options are great in terms of being able to integrate, but you also need to make it easy. And so one of the earliest lessons we learned is to enable developers to go from zero to hero. You don't wanna have to figure out uh, 10 API reference docs, figure out which is the unofficial or official SDK. You want a tutorial that you can read end to end. And so we started to invest in that. We wanted to make it easy for anyone to just sign up and not have to go through an approval or whitelisting process. Um, and we want it to be able for you to work well with a large team. And so you can add multiple developers, add different administrators, owners, et cetera. And then we wanted to make it easy to have a quick feedback loop. As soon as you integrate, you can get analytics on the API, API calls being made. And so you could very quickly get a feedback of whether this is working or not. Um, I think this is uh, often undervalued, but being a good shepherd of your platform. If you look at many of the APIs of the past where, some, where a company thinks it's a great idea to expose some functionality, only to realize later that um, they have competing business interests, 
uh, and they need to kill off these APIs. And I think uh, the best use case without shaming too many people publicly is Twitter. And so we didn't want to create an ecosystem where we say, go and build on top of us, only to shut you down when we compete later. And so we only release APIs that we plan to publicly support for the long term, uh, and we document them as such. Um, I've been a developer for a while now, and so I know what sucks about documentation and what becomes frustrating, and so we really wanted to have polished developer docs that enable you to go from zero to hero. And so we rewrote all of our documentation to follow this structure. And the idea was to pick your integration point, whether this was a widget that you wanted to drop into an iOS app, or whether it was a REST API that you wanted to fully integrate, and to be enable you to go from the very beginning to a completed integration within one tutorial. And so we rewrote all of these public facing docs to follow this flow. And so now this is what we have today. Um, again, building applications and building a platform that interacts with the real world adds another level of complexity because there's a lot of things that you can't control. Riders can cancel, people can get in accidents, all of a sudden um, the EPA can go very far up. And so we wanted to make it easy for any time you make an API call to understand all of the error states and how to resolve those errors. And so in all of our API reference docs, what you can see is that we have not only the success use case, but all of the potential error cases and then how to resolve them. And so when you're building docs for developers, I think most people only really focus on the success case. Here's what I expect to happen. As soon as you open up to the real world and you start soliciting that feedback, you realize people run into errors very quickly and you need to make those errors self-explanatory. And so we started to do this with all of our API docs. So anytime you see a success response, you can see all the potential error scenarios and then also how to uh, remediate those. And then I think this is pretty basic, but having thorough reference docs for your API endpoints with easy to follow examples was really critical. And so everywhere we have, we have all the query parameters, all the uh, request response examples, and then simple scenarios in curl, and then for all of our SDKs. And so we wanted to make it as easy as possible to adopt and to understand how it's supposed to work. Uh, and finally, SDKs and sample apps and enable developers. I, as a developer, don't really like to read documentation. I generally will just take a look at your site, Google on GitHub for an example app, and then I check out your app, and that's how I learn about your API. And so we wanted to build a system that enables this. And so we, the problem with building SDKs is there's a large investment. It's not just releasing the SDK the first time, but it's supporting on every possible platform. On iOS and Android, this is a very heavy investment. And so we started to invest in just a subset of these SDKs, but more importantly, we started to empower the GitHub community to build our unofficial SDKs and make them official by using them in the docs and fully supporting those developers. Um, the other piece is make it safe to play in the sandbox. Uh, again, when, you're, when all of your users are transactional, that means everybody's paying for something. When you're building a global integration, you wanna test whether this functionality works in all these locations around the world, you don't wanna have to pay for each one of those rides. But you also wanna be able to simulate all the potential error scenarios where a rider cancels, a driver cancels, EPA skyrockets, surge goes into effect, all these different solutions. And so we built this sandbox environment that made it very easy and safe to play where you could simulate rides uh, with very little effort. And the rides would be uh, fully simulated in terms of the latitude and longitude would change, the ETA would count down. These were fully simulated rides. And we made it easy to play for free, but also to test these all around the world. Um, another lesson learned was automate the tedious task. Um, oftentimes, uh, just to get started with a REST API, you need to do some OAuth dance where you approve a request for a token, you exchange that for a real token, and then you make API calls with it. And so we wanted to make it as easy as possible to do this. Uh, the same for generating deep links. We had an insane number of support requests, which were, how do I create this deep link? And so we just made a simple wizard where you could set a location to pick you up, your current location, a location to drop you off, which product, and we would just give you the URL you could use inside your application automatically. And so this solved 20% you know, of our support requests with the one day of engineering effort building a, a little wizard. Um, the same for generating access tokens. You don't wanna have to do this whole OAuth dance, you just wanna click a button and be able to get a token and start interacting with our API. And so the more you can automate these tedious tasks for developers to make it self-explanatory to automatically expose the token into your documentation, all of a sudden you have this copy-pasteable experience where they don't have to do any work to uh, achieve an integration. I touched on this a little bit earlier, but errors should be obvious and helpful. A REST API that returns an error should also return the solution to resolving that error. 
And as somebody who's built many APIs, this is often something I think people undervalue and don't invest enough time in. They expect that you'll just read through the docs and figure out eventually what's wrong. Uh, but ultimately, we, whenever we return an error, we also return how you resolve that error. Not only do we document it, but we also uh, expose it directly in the JSON response that we share with you. Uh, and then so great support is critical. You don't want to just have people um, emailing a private channel. You want to build a community around these integrations. And so when we figured out how do we want to support a large open ecosystem, we wanted to go where the developers already live. And that means actively supporting Stack Overflow. So our official channel for support today in Uber's developer platform is to just tag your question with Uber API. And our partner engineering and our developer relations teams are hyper responsive to these threads. Sometimes email is more appropriate, and so we offer a public Google group as well. And so this is where we really wanted to, this is where developers already were. They were already posting questions on Stack Overflow. And so we wanted to make sure we had a really great presence there. Um, developers already share their stories on Medium, and more and more tech companies are releasing on Medium, so we wanted to build our, our publishing and our blogging community around Medium. And then so much of our technology is built on top of open source tools that we wanted to have a great presence on GitHub. So all of our SDKs are maintained in the open. You can see the roadmaps and request features there. Uh, and all of it's available as open source components on uber.github.io. Not only our SDKs and the tools that we release for the external community, but tools like um, uh, the internal tools that we build our systems with, like Jaeger for distributed transaction tracing and distributed applications, uh, RingPop for application level sharding, um, node flame graphs for doing CPU flame graphs with ptrace for node applications. And so not only is it the, the tech that we use, like our SDKs exposed externally, but also all the internal tools we build these APIs with are also available. And it's not just the code, but it's also the knowledge as well. So we wanted to share as much as possible on our Uber engineering blog. And so you can see uh, in much more depth how we actually built some of these APIs, how we scale our node applications, how we do data visualizations with uh, JavaScript, and much more through our Uber engineering blog. And so I'm running low on time, but uh, a short version of what we learned was what works for a single API doesn't work for a developer platform. When we were a, a smaller team just releasing the ride request API, um, the model that we used didn't work as soon as we wanted to empower all these different program teams to build their own APIs. It works when you had a small number of BD-led deals. It doesn't work when you have a large open ecosystem. So we needed to learn how to scale our process and to scale our team. In the same way that we made uh, everything externally self-service, where you can just go to developer.uber.com and sign up, we wanted the same thing for our internal program teams, where they could just go to our service, read our playbook, and build an external API. And so this is what we've done over time. Um, developer value comes from listening to your developers. This should be obvious, but in uh, more than a few cases I've seen where just you know, a large cohort of the developer community gets ignored because there's no business interest in solving that problem. We try to build our roadmap based on the problems we hear from the community and actually sort of uh, resolve those issues. I think this one was an exercise and sort of uh, was a lesson learned uh, specifically to Uber, but the company value is discovered by understanding what your developer platform uniquely brings to your company. In our case, it wasn't just about facilitating growth through external deals. It was also about en enabling internal program teams to build these APIs uh, and to build a more engaging experience. And so the challenge is not technology, it's imagination. You can find out more at developers.uber.com and you can find out more in depth uh, on our Uber engineering blog. And so I think I'm at my limit on time, but I'm happy to take Q&A. And I know I went a little bit fast, so all of these slides are available on speakerdeck.com slash Dustin Whittle, and feel free to tweet at me, and I'm happy to answer any questions.